In Laos, a region called Udamsai has many people in need. And a pastor we'll call TK knows that he's been called by the Lord to minister in this place of great need. For some reason, I kept having dreams and visions about Udamsai, something about assisting those that are hurt, fire, or earthquake, or orphanage, or flooding. When I was in prison one of those days, I had a vision or a dream that the angel came down and talked to me and said, will you serve me? Will you be faithful? I look at that vision as a sign from the Lord that I should be in Udamsai today where I'm serving. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help, right now on The Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. Welcome again to The Voice of the Martyrs Radio. My name is Todd Nettleton. We're about to hear an interview with a pastor that we are just going to call TK for his safety. We're not going to give his full name. He is one of our partners here at The Voice of the Martyrs to serve persecuted Christians in Laos. We recorded this on the road in Asia, so the sound quality is going to be a bit different from what we get in our studio here. You'll hear some of Pastor TK's voice, but mostly you'll hear the voice of his interpreter. And you're going to hear about how God is at work in Laos, offering hope in this communist country. I asked Pastor TK how he first came to faith in Christ. Actually, the first believer in my family was my father. My father was uh, arrested uh, and put in prison in Lubumbang province on charges of drugs. At that time in that province, my, my, you could say my dad was, was more like a kingpin, you could say, because he had a lot of money and he had <coughs> five people under him. Some of his underlings got caught in Vientiane and somehow it leaked up that yeah, that he was behind it. Yeah. He lost everything. And somebody evangelized to my father in prison. That's when my father heard about Christ. So when he came home from prison, how, how was he different? How did you notice the differences that God had made in his life? Even I noticed a big difference because we had money at that time and everything was lost in my family and seized. But when my dad came back, he still felt joy, peace, uh, you know, from everything, a nice house, whatever. We, we, we started renting house, but he still found joy and was smiling all the time. So at that time, I was still, my heart was still hardened because I heard about Christians getting arrested. And so this religion is somewhat embarrassing, so I didn't want to know about it. You know, I didn't want people to look at me in a bad light if I accepted Christ because I didn't want anything to do with it. Did he feel a lot of shame from his dad having been in prison? Was that a shameful thing or not so much? I felt normal. I mean, it wasn't nothing to be ashamed. So you weren't ashamed that your dad had gone to prison for being a drug dealer. But if you were to go to prison for being a Christian, that would be embarrassing. I was really influenced by society of my friends. Because I was really influenced by my friends. But when my father came to Christ, he opened my eyes a lot that the group that I was hanging out with weren't the greatest influence on me. From They were drinking, they were partying, they were doing things that were not beneficial to their life. So that really woke me up too. You know, I, I had money. My family was money, so I was able to, you know, spend, spend, spend. But then I started getting hooked up. When we lost the money, I started hooked up with friends. My friends took me to places that, that were not beneficial. I started getting hooked on drugs, going deep, deep down into that stage. And I realized that this is not beneficial for my life. And then one day I got extremely ill, sick. So I, even though I was ill, I tried to approach my friends and really none of them could recommend or help me or they weren't really sincere. I could go back, decide to go back to my father, but we didn't have the money, the resources to, to be healed. I was just really severely ill. One night I decided to go into my room and, and just talk to God or, or I don't know what, if I was talking to God, even just thinking to myself that, okay, I'm ill, I'm sick. If you are the true God, and you are real, I will commit my life to you. But I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what servant is, but I will just commit my life to you. I was coughing and ill. I was coughing up blood. And then every night I was just coughing. I could not sleep. And that day when I asked God, when I went to bed, 
I could sleep through the night, no cough. I got up the next morning, I felt completely healed, completely well. And I said, wow, this is the true God. <laughs> And I went to my father and said, Dad, can you lead me to Christ? And then from that moment on, I wanted to know more about Christ. And he said, okay, if you want to know, my father said, you want to know about Christ, go to a certain family. They know more about scripture. They have a CD about Jesus. Go get that CD and you can know about Jesus. The Jesus film. I, yeah, when I, when I put on the CD and saw the movie and when I saw Jesus crucified on the cross, I cried. Despite wanting to serve Christ and knowing they didn't really know how to train me or really guide me through my Christian walk or even really accept Christ. How old were you at this, at this point? When you accepted Christ, how old were you? I was about 20. So then who discipled you? How did you grow in your faith? So actually there was a certain American missionary that got close in our area that knows Dad Seal really well. And so through him, I was able to go to Bible school because there's KCC was kind of starting up at that time and I saw churches being planted and that's something that, that, that inspired me. And so through through the friendship of, of this certain American missionary, my dad, I was able to attend Bible, Bible school in Thailand? Thailand. Yes, Bible school in Thailand. But through this American missionary, he told me to go to uh, a certain area for seminar training to see how the Christian life is, how they worship. And, and that time I was really excited. I went there and I got a lot of ministry materials back. And that's when I got arrested at the border checkpoint. Mm -hmm. I got arrested and put in prison for three months. And you were arrested crossing from Thailand back into Laos mm -hmm. with Christian materials. We don't, don't look at me, me, I pok, me, 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 me. Yes, I was arrested because I had Christian materials. The officers at the border, when they saw the Christian materials, what did they say? Mm -hmm. or, or how did you know this was going to be a big problem? As I was crossing the border, I knew the risk because I met with some Christian leaders that told me that you've got to prepare for this risk if you're going to take these materials across. And so when the police saw the materials that I had, they threatened me. They said, do you know about this certain pastor? He's in prison for 15 years. You know, if you keep doing this, or we're going to catch you, you could die in prison, even worse than that guy. But I knew the risk because God is real. Like He healed me, so I was prepared to take that risk. So no second thoughts, even after the threats. Mm -hmm. I, I was no, going to take that risk. I'm going to bring those because I was full of passion to want to proclaim the gospel. So did they take away all the Christian materials? Mm -hmm. So when they took me, they just took me, you could say, secretly. They didn't inform my family or anything. My family didn't know I was arrested until two weeks later. Yeah, and so if they wanted to kill me, I could have just disappeared. They wouldn't know where my whereabouts are. And did they say... If you will stop this, if you'll deny your faith, you can go home? Or was the, did they make it really open, like, that's what we expect, and if you'll do that, we'll let you go? No, they didn't give me the option to renounce my faith because they had a whole case against me already. There's no option. So there's, they wanted to make an example out of you, not necessarily get you to... Yes, there's no fairness, no justice. We have something against you. There's no option for you to renounce or anything. Now, did they talk to you about this whole idea that you must be a spy? If you were a Christian, you must be a spy. You're working for the Americans. You're working for somebody else, Westerners? No, they were, the only time they ever asked when they arrested me was, where did you come from? What did you do? Because they already seized all my materials. So there's really... I mean, they, they already knew behind. They don't the have scenes. to ask a lot of questions. Yeah, they, they just have they, they have all the evidence right there. But I think that behind the scenes, they're even indoctrinated or brainwashed that this is a tool. So they they probably have the whole evidence there that I've been running around doing evangelism with this stuff. If I go back to Laos, and they held you for three months. Three months. So how? What was going on in your spirit during that time? Were you discouraged? Were you encouraged? Did you feel like? Oh, I must be doing something right. They're persecuting me. Or what was going on in your thoughts and in your mind? When I sat in prison, I started thinking that, wow, if they don't kill me, I will be in there for the long haul. Mm -hmm. So I started looking at my age, that I'm 20. Let's say 20 years, I'll be 40. There's still some time to do something with my life. But during my time in prison, I prayed and got closer to it, and I started having visions about, about 
how to proceed or how how you know. But I still felt joy and peace. But that time, but that time, I was dating somebody, and so I think the hardest part was just I missed her so much. That was the hardest part in prison was was missing my girlfriend. Did you have opportunities in prison to talk to other prisoners or to talk to guards about? Faith and about Christ. Yes, yes, we had opportunities, but but it was not only me in prison. There was uh, eight other believers separate, but there was three with me in prison as we got. Caught. And they all got caught coming back across the border from the same seminar, right? Yes, we all got caught during the same time. Okay. When I got released from prison, I really wanted to study the Bible. It was, it was one of my goals. How have you seen persecution for Christians in Laos? How is it different today than it was when you first became a believer? Or is it the same? It's just more. I, I definitely think that there is a difference from when I was there to presently, which, which back in the day when I got in prison that time, they will harm you physically or your flesh, throw you in prison, arrest you, whatever. But now today... It's more about your mental psychology, your spiritual well-being, that they'll play with you, they'll persecute you. Before, kill you, imprison you, physical abuse. Beat you. Beat you. Destroy your livestock. Now, they don't do that. I mean, not openly not like before. Usually. Family book, they'll seize that. Mm. Your family registration book. Mm-hmm. You can believe Christ, but you cannot stay in this village if you do. Yes, you can believe Christ, but I will not give you opportunity if you graduate from high school to further up your future education. Because you can believe, but get out of the house. Which type of persecution do you think is more difficult for the believer? The, the physical punishment or the uh, isolation and cutting off their future? Mm-hmm. Presently, with them seizing the books and and not cutting off your future is the is the harshest. That's harder to That's harder. endure than. Mm-hmm. A, a teach a, you know you beat. You're, it will heal. You kill. You go to heaven. Simple, but here you endure the suffering of, of the flesh on this earth. So he brought up about families the akar. Till today, three years evicted, cannot go back. How do you move? They'll just leave you like that. You go to anywhere they you have no future. You. you have no future. No. You don't exist in the in in, in the consensus. You beat a person, you kill them. They can see that this person loves Christ to give their life. You see, in the early church, the church grew. But if you go with the taking their future, taking their available eviction. This will set an example to other people to not believe Christ, because this is what happens when you believe in Christ. This is what you will face. So getting beat or killed is, generally speaking, better. So a martyr is an inspiration to other followers of Christ, mm-hmm. whereas someone who's their house is torn down or they're kicked out of the village, they're a warning to everyone else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Don't. Don't don't follow in their footsteps. Mm-hmm. So when you get martyred and beaten or beaten badly up to death, it, people see that this person is willing to lay his life. Why is that? Whereas you get stripped of everything, it's your future. No one wants that. I give an example about evangelism in school. You see, those who accept Christ, they cannot graduate, they cannot have a future. Why well, believe in Christ? You will go nowhere. Are you willing to destroy your future for this religion? So how do you prepare new believers to stand up under that kind of pressure and not renounce their faith? I prepare them by sharing my father's testimony and my testimony that I have endured and persevered as a living example to them to see. And then I go talking about verses in the Bible. So one of the things that you do now is you help serve those who are being persecuted, who are right in the midst of that. Um, what what does it mean to them when you show up and say, I'm here to help you. I want to make sure you have a place to stay. I want to make sure that your needs are being met. 
how do they respond to that when you show up in in that kind of role? Yang no ai ke ke bae I'm speaking honestly. I am pretty high up in my position with with the LEC. But I still humble myself to approach those that are in need poor. That's that's what really incurs them a lot. Because for me, I, I could care less about that, but it's about the people that I serve, the persecuted. So that's what really encourages. Even though some are not my people group, language, culture, I still go. So the fact that you have this uh, position of authority in the LAC, and yet you're out there in the village actually hands-on mm-hmm. helping people mm-hmm. is really meaningful to them. I am, I am a voice for those in my area for the persecuted because it goes up to the smaller to the higher authorities and it's, I'm, I'm pretty transparent with them too mm-hmm. you know you see mm-hmm. to me that sounds ideal like like you're not trying to hide what you're doing i'm i'm helping persecuted christians mm-hmm. and i'm part of the lac i'm i have a position of authority in the lac it it seems like the two really work really well together no. i want to keep that relationship as that position so tell tell me some stories of recent cases. Mm. What what type of persecution are you seeing in the last say six months? Mm-hmm. And then how are are you responding to those needs? I've had some cases where Christian uh, their livestock or their fields have been mm-hmm. torn or burned, and I can't replace all their needs, but I give them some buffaloes to replace. Through the company, uh, we've had a oh, certain witch doctor that came to Christ, and he he was called the traitor, and that was a big deal. But we replaced the firewood uh, that they burned down. They poisoned livestock. We were able to replace it. But now, when you say they poisoned livestock, is that like people in that village, or is that like mm. the police, or? Saban kap puyaban. It would be the non-Christians surrounding in the so village for, for this the community. Kind of. And so, I mean, the head of the village will know by, but he will allow it. He'll turn a blind eye. Sadly, the livestock that we replaced by the company got poisoned again. So, the, for this specific case, we were talking about how can we? We don't want them to win. Right. What is tangible? So we got rice instead. Because with chicken, they run around. So, and, and the opposite is true as well. If the head of the village says, don't mess with the Christians, leave them alone, they will be left alone. Yes, that is correct. The head of the village will, will protect you. If he says, they're good people, we allow it. If there's, if there's a persecution case, the authorities or something I hear about, they call me. I actually, my role can go up to the provincial, the district governor, to talk about this case. And it'll come down. To help solve. I have to be very careful if I'm going to go this route. It's not a card you want to play very often. You have to have all the right information, evidence that it's really happening. Because if you don't get it right, I will be in serious trouble with the authorities. And you don't want that. I don't want that. There is so many persecution cases, you know, that I get. It's just a matter of what's serious, what's not. If it's not serious, please persevere. If it's serious, you know, I will do something about it. So do you typically hear directly from the Christian who is facing persecution? Do you hear like from their pastor or from someone in authority? Do you hear from KCC? How, how do you hear about a persecution case? Number one, they call me. Number two is the inside seminars that we company support. And one of the key things is the city seminar that I call all the local leaders to come and gather. That's where I hear the information. The Lord has placed you in a very mm-hmm. specific position to to be able to fit all these pieces together. Mm-hmm. I feel that way, so so thank you. Um, I'm actually from Luhabang province. <laughs> For some reason, I kept having dreams and visions about Udumsai. Something about assisting those that are hurt, fire, or earthquake, or orphanage, or flooding. And it just kept... Appearing in my vision pom, or dream. Pom, pom, pom pay, nah? And I, I never went there before Udom Sai. I don't know what happened. I don't know why. When I was in prison, one of those days, I had a vision or a dream that the angel came down and talked to me and said, Will you serve me? Will you be faithful? Will you marry your girlfriend? And that time, even with my girlfriend, we weren't as serious. I'm not sure if I was going to commit to her. And when I said yes to this, a week later, I got out of prison. I don't know how I got out. 
Being, that's when I realized the Lord really led me and guided me, and I gotta go study the Bible. I look at that vision as a sign from the Lord that I should be in Udom side today where I'm serving. What's the hardest part of your work? Mm. It's not enough leaders to over, over, oversee the, the flock. More shepherds, more leadership. The more we push, the more we bring people to Christ, the more needs there are. But it's a lot of the poor people that come to Christ and they have nothing. So when they have nothing, they look at me as, as their source of, of hope, of something to rely on. When some are sick, they come to Udon Sai City, they stay at my house for a week. I understand that there's a number of young people, teenagers, who have been kicked out of their families because of their faith. One of the things that I really focus on with these young teenagers when they get with their persecution is that change their life so that their parents can see that they they have a change of behavior and example. You know, I've encouraged them when they go get a job or work, send money back to your mom, dad. You know, buy little gifts for them to see that you still care for them. But what happens if the parents they don't want to have anything to do with the kids anymore because of their because they're Christian? You can't really go back, you know, because they're already out. But the second thing is that if this really happens, I will go and talk to the parents face to face. Like, are you really sure about this? Are you sure this is your son or daughter? Are you okay with your permission that they come stay with me for the time being? When I hear about this, I, it's also a chance for me to share about the gospel that, that this is what it's about. We just had a case where the daughter went back of a certain family. Her parents are school teachers. And you know, school teacher, government job, Christian, no. Stayed with uh, TK for a while, uh, V Company supported, and now the daughter went back by the understanding of the parents that it's okay for their daughter to believe Christ. After how long? Like how long had she been out of the house? About three years. Three years? Three years. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. That's about three years. So how many, how much room do you have in your house for extra, <laughs> extra teenagers to come and live? <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I do have to care for my own kids. Mm -hmm. Right now they're sleeping on, on a floor in a different area because we have tons of kids. Yeah. I, I really opened my heart. So you can stay here. It could be cramped, but not cramped in my heart. How can we pray? You, you've talked about praying for you and for your ministry, but if we look at the whole country of Laos, how can we pray for the country and for the church? Please pray for the authorities to, to understand about the, the Christian religion and the constitution because right now they're giving a hard time about, about movement because when you go anywhere or evangelism or Christian events, you must get permission from, from a certain area or head of the village and, and they'll ask you for your car and they'll just make things difficult to, to visit, even Christian. TK, thank you for sharing with us. It's a <laughs> blessing to meet you. I'm just so thankful um, to have you pray for me. And as long as you guys pray for us and assisting the persecuted, we'll keep persevering and, and keep fighting and, and, and until the Lord comes. I hope you'll pray this week for Pastor TK and for the country of Laos and the church there. In fact, if God's putting that on your heart, maybe you want to take out your phone right now and set a reminder to pray this week for the country of Laos. Maybe you want to text a Christian friend and ask them to pray with you specifically for Laos. While you've got your phone out, you can also get daily reminders to pray for persecuted Christians when you download the new VOM app. We have just completely redesigned the app you can put that on your tablet or your smartphone. Just search in the App Store for Voice of the Martyrs. Search for VOM app. Install that. You can be reminded every day with a new prayer request from persecuted Christians around the world. If you missed any part of our conversation with Pastor TK from Laos, you can hear it again by visiting our website, vomradio.net. I hope you'll share this interview with someone else as well, maybe your pastor, maybe another Christian friend. You can get a link and share it by visiting our website. Again, that is vomradio.net. Next week, we're going to stay in Asia. We're going to move over to Central Asia and hear how God is encouraging believers in Tajikistan. 
I know that will encourage you as well. So please be back with us next week right here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network.